Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so today uh, we'll be talking about cultivating performance mindset. My name is Nar Sainarath. Um, the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because I've been a new installment on the performance team at Sentry, and I've learned a lot of things along the way that I really want to show to other people and just kind of make, like performance is a hard problem and looking at this stuff requires a lot of um, investigation. And I think just getting started in this space is very difficult. So we want to kind of like bring it back and make it a little bit more approachable, talk to you guys about some of the concepts that we can see here. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my, I'm a software engineer at Sentry. Again, I've been put on the performance team. That's our like little dashboard homepage place. But uh, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing for, uh, for you guys here. For those of you that don't know, Sentry, it, their bread and butter is error, uh, error monitoring. So you install an SDK. If your application uh, you know, fails to compute something, throws an error, an exception, uh, we send that to the platform so you can aggregate it and take a, get a lot of insight into where your application's failing and how to fix issues. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make performance as easy to solve as errors because a lot of that is um, very difficult to tra uh, trace back to a single point of failure. Um, when, as I've been here, I've been working with a lot of like really, really strong performance-oriented engineers, and I've been amazed at like the skills and reasoning that they've used their tools. And we're going to be talking about stuff that I've learned um, and how you yourself can start thinking about implementing performance in your application in such a way that it's proactive, so you're always prepared to tackle some of those issues. So the agenda for today is to talk about why performance matters and how you can easily start tracking performance today. Along the way, we'll also be talking about Sentry's features and how we're helping out build that stuff. So the first topic is why does performance matter? I like to answer this in uh, one of three questions, and hopefully you guys will feel some kind of relation to some of these questions. Number one is like, do you care about your users? So we all build up features for our users to bring value to them. And performance is a huge consideration as your application gains a lot of traction in terms of scaling once you start in, uh, getting more data in, in there. Um, users are gonna be left out of being able to take full use of your services if you're not able to scale and perform to their needs. So think about a time where you've had to wait for a loading spinner and how did that make you feel? Did it make you consider like looking for another product? Um, you know, for us as developers, we can look into like the dev tools and figure out what's exactly going on. You know, we usually find Sentry in there. Um, you can see if an error is like 500 or a request is errored out, and or you can just see if it's still pending. But you know, your typical everyday coders aren't. I mean, everyday non-coding friends aren't really going to be able to do that. They'll look for someplace else. Which brings me to my next question: Is uh, you know, do you like money? Because uh, I, I do, I do I like money. <laughs> but there's a lot of contemporary research right now where, uh, for example, Shopify paired up with this uh, company called BCG, Boston Consulting Group, and they were able to correlate um, performance issues with uh, lower, uh, decreased lower funnel conversion, which basically means customers who are ready to actually purchase a thing, whether or not they ended up purchasing that thing. Um, they found that if you had over 90 seconds of time from adding to a cart and checking out, you actually lost about 50% of your users there. Um, another cool place to see uh, this, this kind of like contemporary research is a website called WPO Stats. So they highlight and showcase a lot of different uh, case studies where people have instrumented or they've also like dived deep into their data to figure out their performance issues and uh, how they fix them. It's, it's a huge art. It's a skill that you know, you're working on lifelong. So the, those are some links down there below. I'll be sharing these slides later on. And uh, my final but like favorite question, because I stress about it all the time, is uh, do you like to sleep at night <laughs> you know, without having to worry that your big cu customer is going to take down your application by using stuff too much? Um, you know, how many of us here actually do have that one customer where we know that like, they're the stress test? right? We might have some data and stuff. But uh, if they get their hands on it, we might be in for some problems. And you, know, you might argue that uh, we could be able to uh, account for this ahead of time. But sometimes we can't. We work with like, very complex systems. We need to make sure that we get insight into our applications. I've been unnecessarily stressed before, trying to figure out months after my features were released, trying to figure out, uh, OK, how do I make this faster? But there's nothing there keeping me uh, on track. So does performance matter? 
I think it matters to all of us. We're all stakeholders. It matters to our users, to your company, to us. Uh, users want you know to get the full benefit of what you're providing them. Your company is relying on you, and it matters to you to instrument your application so you're not uh, stressing out when it comes to actually handling all the other stuff in your work. So because we're at Sentry, um, we have two kinds of things that we really look into in terms of like application degradation. So we see that there are errors and there's also performance issues. I wanna highlight a bit of a difference between these. Errors are a very pinpoint event where you can get a stack trace and usually you can walk back up the stack trace to find the smoking gun. And that's, that's what makes errors like very, very easy to solve. But performance issues are usually a regression over time. And you don't really know when things are gonna get bad. But uh, you know, that's why it's really important for us to build out tooling to help us track down these issues and navigate into um, the, the most efficient path to finding the solutions. And you could fix all of the errors in your application, but if you have a memory leak or you have some other performance issues in your application that uh, users that eventually will find out about, it could be like this, right? You know, you might be like, oh, this is fine, this is fine. But if your users aren't reporting stuff to you, everything's on fire, uh, it's a mess, right? So ideally, the more that we can think about doing this stuff, the more we can be efficient, hopefully we can bring it down to this. So to simplify the process, we've kind of broken it down into four different steps. And these steps are to collect data, to use that data to detect something, you can make a fix, and then to monitor. Today we're gonna to be focusing on the collection and detection of data. Um, a lot of that is kind of like where things are becoming very complicated. And as soon as you can detect things, you understand the problem space, you can actually think better about how to make a fix to, uh, you can deploy a fix and you know, reap the benefits of that as well. Um, the entry point into the cycle is to collect data. So just to start there, uh, how do we, what kinds of things can we collect? And the kinds of things that we can collect are metrics, traces, and profiles. All of these are gonna be very, very helpful at different stages during the performance investigation. Um, we'll start with metrics because they're the most simple and we'll move down into the very fine grain uh, profiles. So at the bare minimum, metrics are just a number. Usually we try to correlate them with timestamps because that gets us to do stuff like plot them on nice graphs and we can see how things change over time. Um, some very common uh, metrics to look at are transaction, uh, sorry, throughput, uh, some duration and CPU and memory stuff. So this all gives you insight into at a high level like how is my application performing. The next thing that we move into are called traces. So the thing about traces is now we have to consider they're a collection of what's called a span. Before in metrics land, we only had timestamp and potentially uh, one uh, a number, but now we have a start and an end timestamp in this case. These are usually given a name, they record some kind of operation, and you can find them related in parent-child relationships. So these can be grouped together and represented in a way that's very easy to understand like what's going on in your application. And uh, you, we can see an example here where we have like a, a request that's uh, trying to get some inventory and eventually we go down into the database level. So this is giving us information about how our application's performing. Uh, if you've ever worked in the, the front end, like you might have seen this in network tabs in uh, your browser dev tools. And interesting about traces is that as you, as you build out your system and you gain more and more services, you can actually connect traces so then you get a full end-to-end -end, uh, understanding of what your application's doing. We call this a distributed trace. Usually what happens is you have a trace ID that's propagated across your, uh, your requests, but uh, then you get any time you want to understand uh, the timing in your application, you can dig deep into that here. So this is the most powerful form we find of like exploratory performance data. Um, yeah, amazing to do it. If you can instrument uh, all services in your application to work well with each other, uh, it's the ecosystem, right? It's why a lot of people have Apple Watches and MacBooks. I don't though, but. <laughs> the, the next thing we have is uh, profiles. This is the most granular type of data that we can get. And they're similar in a way to traces, but instead of showing activity over time of some kind of operation with some name, uh, these are actually gonna look at stack activity. 
So we'll also typically, because we're low level there, uh, we're, looking, we're getting function names. We can also surface CPU and memory data as well. And this is the best option for looking for code level insights to your application. Um, bear in mind, you know, profiles, because we're digging deep into the code there, uh, there is some consideration on where we're going to be using these tools and how we're going to be using them. So the, the team that was working on the profiling stuff at Sentry, they try to keep a threshold of 1% to 5% CPU overhead. Now, that's going to be something that you need to determine is acceptable or not for your application, but it is seriously very, very powerful if you can dig as deep as that to find out your issues. We can take a look here. This is an example of what a profile looks like. This is uh, represented in what's called a flame chart. Uh, you can actually invert it, and it looks like flames. It's pretty cool. But uh, you can see as time moves on, you can see different function calls being made, and things are returning all the way up. Uh, what we've highlighted here is uh, get products. And you can see that there's a connection being made and some iteration. This may give you some ideas into like where you want to look into your code. So now we know like there, there's some things to collect. Uh, how do we actually collect data? The way that we collect data is that you're, the easiest way is to look for some kind of monitoring solution. And uh, you know, Sentry, hello. <laughs> so uh, we have lots and lots of different kinds of SDKs that you can look at. Um, you know, we're here at a Python conference, so great to plug, it, plug some Python SDKs. Uh, we have about 23 of them for different libraries and stuff that we can look into. Uh, very, very basic ones are, uh, you know, our Python, uh, base Python. You can get uh, Django, Fast API, and Flask. We try to hit like a lot of them big players in the ecosystem. This is making it a lot easier to send data and look at it in the same place. Um, the API is very, very easy for, for us to use rather than like, trying to instrument this stuff like manually. And a lot of uh, good things that come with using a predefined monitoring solution is that uh, our SDK developers do a great job at automatically instrumenting what's useful to people, which gets you leagues beyond you know, just starting to manually put things into your application. Uh, for example, if you're using Django, then uh, anytime you operate with the Django ORM, we'll, we'll record those database operations for you. So this is a little bit of a code snippet about uh, what it's like to custom, like cust add some custom instrumentation around your code. And uh, we have a little bit of an e eating pizza operation here. And maybe you want to find out like how much it takes to like, eat your pizza. Well, um, you can start this transaction. And what a transaction is, is just a trace that we're going to ingest. And we're going to pull off some metrics from it. And um, this is all you need in, in uh, Python to start recording something. Because what it'll do is it creates a context. And once you exit the context, the, the data gets sent to our servers. So at this point, you might be asking, OK, now what? And I mean, uh, that was me like about a few months ago as well. But uh, at this point, you know, we know how to start getting data. We know how to start. Um, collecting it, what we need to know is like what's important to us. So we're zeroing in on how to use these tools. One thing that's like really important to be able to do is align yourself with what matters most to you, and usually that's whatever matters most to uh, the company's goals at the time. So you can look at thinking about service level objectives or SLOs. These are kind of like um, numbers or or a range of numbers as we have there. Um, about like what you want to hit to be able to be successful for your users. And an example here is like if you have an endpoint and you say, I need it to be um, less than 500 milliseconds because otherwise it won't, uh, you know, I, I don't feel confident in having this as a uh, customer experience, then that's your, that's your metric. So the, these SLOs guide what are like thresholds for you. And it's really important to consider what your thresholds are because you can only make performance improvements once you back them against a certain baseline. These can be anything you want. Um, there are industry standards for certain things, and if you can find an industry standard for uh, what kind of metrics are important to you, that would be uh, the best way that you can kind of handle this, but sometimes it's not actually where you're at. So an example here is uh, you, in the front end, we have core web vitals. And Google sets these out. They make certain they do a lot of research, and you can find out that there's a standard for something. Let's say it's called largest contentful paint, which is when your web page finishes loading like the largest uh, item there. 
And if that doesn't load within 2.5 seconds, uh, your user experience is actually considered a little bit like less, less great. Um, a tip that we have here is you can actually set your threshold slightly above your current behavior. And in doing so, you'll be able to make sure that you're keeping an eye on whether or not things are getting worse. So without any industry standards, you can kind of uh, do that as well and then shrink from there. So moving into a few, a few tips that we have for collecting data, one of them we have is uh, don't miss the forest for the trees. So this means that we need to actually instrument our application at, to get the full insight into our user experience at the highest level that they can. Um, because it doesn't actually do our users too good if we are instrumenting at a lower level, uh, we're not seeing the full picture of the latency between our services. And an example is, you know, let's say you want to implement your front-end uh, app. So if you're only implementing uh, instrumentation in your back-end, you might be missing out on a lot of, like, uh, a lot of different wasted time in the front-end. Something as well is uh, commits are free. So I mean, this, this definitely assumes that you have like a very, very regular deployment cycle. But if you're investigating performance issues in data, uh, you should feel very encouraged to start tagging more data, collecting more information as you understand more and more of uh, what's going on. Because we don't know everything from the beginning, and we'll be able to find ways to slice and dice our data and figure out what's, how users are moving throughout the code to cause these issues. Because again, we're thinking about these, this stuff in systems. So some of the questions we can ask here are, what users are hitting this code path? What kind of plan or tier are they? And what kind of parameters were involved in, the re in certain requests? Because that usually dictates like different conditions and different code paths. The more you ask these questions, the more you can start uh, getting more insight into your code. And another thing here is, uh, you know, there's very like common bottlenecks and pitfalls that people have. So if you're developing a feature where you're handling I.O. or queuing up tasks or doing a lot of like serialization and deserialization, those are the places where you really want to kind of keep a lookout for. So make sure that those features are, are well implemented, uh, well instrumented. And uh, you know, just to kind of go over them, the reasons why these things are slow is because file I.O. Uh, to cross that boundary uh, requires a lot of like um, code level or operating level steps to write to the, the disk. And if you queue things up, depending on how you queue them up and the number of workers and things, you can get insight into whether or not you're wasting uh, uh, some time waiting for things to finish. And we've seen before uh, serialization and deserialization negatively affects your performance by um, putting a higher load on uh, taking, taking data and putting it into classes. So you may want to consider using more simple uh, implementations like name tuples or data classes. Okay, again, so now what, right? So now we know uh, we have some data. We know like where we want to look at some data. Uh, how do we make something? How do we get some use out of it? One way of doing so is that uh, we can now use it for detection. And to detect issues, uh, there are a range of techniques, and they span from reactive to proactive. So starting with uh, the first one, which is uh, user complaints. User complaints are like the most reactive approach, but they're, they're the most easy. You don't have to do anything. Um, they'll tell you, but this is, this is the best signal that you can get from your users from a use case, because they're telling you something is not working for them. Um, that's golden. The downside of this is that it's not very consistent, and sometimes users aren't actually very good at explaining what's going wrong, um, which is why we need to rely on the data here. This is why like data, data, data is very, very important. Um, an example is if your users so happening to use your app when they have a slow network uh, connection, they may think it's like certain uh, different causes in your uh, in your code. But moving into like more of the data side of things, now that we're collecting a lot of stuff, uh, we can actually start setting up alerts. And this is where like those thresholds come into, into play as well. Because you can actually zero in on different kinds of metrics that you're looking at and uh, correlate when certain regressions occur to different causal events. Uh, again, here, this is where I say a tip. You know, If you're monitoring your application for the first time, start with just setting your thresholds a little bit higher. Perfect, you'll know if like things are getting slow or not. Um, here is 
how that alert like shows up in Sentry. This is how we set it up. So we might be watching our metrics over time. This is a uh, duration for a checkout uh, request. Um, but you can see that there's a spike, and we can set different levels from green, which is good, to uh, warning, which is yellow, and then critical, which is red. And at each, each stage, once we cross these boundaries, we can set notifications, because we need to know, um, maybe we don't really care if there's a warning, but if it gets so bad that you know, we're, we're skyrocketing, then we need to know we have to drop everything and look after this. Uh, one, one thing that, one use case for this as well is like throughput. If for some reason your system stops sending any events, maybe your system's down. And, and that's something that you really want to keep track of here as well. The, um, the most proactive in terms of like looking at this data is going to be looking at traces and profiling. And what you're doing here is that you're doing a workflow where you go and you look for different ways to cut your data into uh, different segments and find out which users and which, uh, if you're adding data to your uh, events, we call those tags, you can find out which tags are actually contributing to um, the slowness. One thing to note here is that not all seconds are equal. So we might have two kinds of operations. And what we mean by this is we're looking to make the most impact. We're lazy people, right? So the, uh, the impact that we want to make is going to be from looking at where time is spent, but also knowing that this is being hit often. And uh, this, because if you have, for example, like a full data export that's only maybe hit maybe once a month, then that's not going to be as effective, even if it takes an hour, even if that takes like 30 minutes or an hour, that's not really that important to optimize. But if your authentication is taking about like two or three seconds, you're wasting so much time there that your users could be doing to get to the end. And one thing here is uh, we also have um, Sentry is building out a lot of automated performance issues. So this is probably even beyond proactive in the sense that your tooling is set up to highlight things for you. So one of the, the ones that people really like to see is N plus one issues. We're able to detect from the incoming performance data that your application is making this kind of um, like, like linear um, uh, request to the database where you get a bunch of items and then uh, you're making smaller requests down the line. But we're always trying to figure out more things. So there's like, we have really slow DB queries, uh, consecutive DB queries, and also large HTTP payloads if you're communicating over servers and just getting a lot of data to, again, serialize and deserialize. So once we've um, identified some stuff as potentially actionable, we need to know like how, how is it actionable. This is kind of like the hardest part. Um, it requires a lot of exploratory work. You're going to want to actually uh, look into your data. And uh, you have to kind of compare good example use cases and bad example use cases. So that actually is very important in um, understanding how you can like slice and dice your data. Because once you can compare it, then you can like zero in on, on what the changes are and make, so, make those fixes uh, as well. In this case, we're looking at um, a high-level metric. This is uh, a chart of an endpoint that's trying to just get a bunch of products. Um, we may ask ourselves, like, okay, why is this thing taking six seconds? It's, it's stable, so maybe this doesn't actually show up as anything interesting to you. But knowing contextually that we're just listing a bunch of products here, uh, it might not be that interesting. Or it might be interesting why it's six seconds. So you can actually go into some of the events here. And again, we're going from metrics down into traces now. We're looking at what is happening during this request for a user. So you may look at a few, and you may see that, um, again, we have this uh, a string of database calls, which is actually taking time because they're all serially uh, being fetched. Potentially, we were forming a, forming a hypothesis here where we're like, OK, maybe that's something that doesn't need to happen. Maybe we could collapse those. Or we also see that there's. Um, some iteration happening at the end that's taking four seconds. We can, again, start instrumenting more, understanding what's happening in there, and move forward towards fixing a solution. Um, after that, uh, you can fix, uh, you, you uh, define a fix. Um, there's, there's not too much that we can actually say about this today because it's very dependent on the context of your application, but we have a lot of uh, common solutions like. You can add data caching to your 
uh, endpoints. That way you can make them a little less expensive. Um, N plus one queries are a very easy fix. And if you wanted to implement, improve like uh, search, you can add an index. Or there's always like looking into like improved algorithm runtime, which is a whole book in and of itself, and a course in and of itself. <laughs> Once you've deployed your fix, you're going to have to monitor the solution. And after that, you're not going to be doing too much different, but you're going to be looking at the data just to confirm. And you know, if it ends up being true, it feels so good to see that, you know, that line drop down to be a, a lower level and be stable as well. Um, along the way, you've probably added a lot of data collection that you don't really need, but sometimes you have stuff that you uh, do need to, uh, to uh, keep because it might be important for you later on. Just clean up your after yourself because uh, most of the time that, that costs money. It adds complexity to the code and a little bit overhead as well. In an ideal world, we want to keep everything, but we, we can't. So just to kind of recap, like there are some certain Sentry features we've seen that uh, help make all this stuff a bit easier. Um, things like setting up the, your SDK to send transactions, um, creating alerts is, is a very powerful technique to know when things are regressing. And using the different pages in Sentry, you can actually look at uh, different durations. And for TPM is uh, your events per minute or transactions per minute is what we call them. And you can correlate where your, your impact is going to be the most. And trends is something where we can actually highlight different transactions and when they're getting worse. So you can go into the ones that are regressing the most. We also have suspect tags and spans, which if you're adding data and stuff, we're showing you the most expensive operations during a particular uh, endpoint. And one of the, the most interesting things is we're automating a lot of stuff for you. So uh, we're, again, we've got some N plus one queries, we got uh, all those like DB queries, but also we're looking at uh, adding some kind of statistical analysis as well. That's gonna be coming down in the future, but it's gonna be very interesting. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's it, that's my time. Uh, we've got a booth. We're over by the forum hall entrance. Uh, I don't know if we have too much time for questions, but please stop by if you're interested in what we do. We'd love to talk. Thank you very much for the great talk. We do have time for two, or one or two questions. There's a microphone over there. Uh, if somebody wants to ask a question, please hurry, and then we'll maybe get one or two. Uh. We, yeah, I think we can get one, potentially. Cool. Okay, your question, please. Yeah, hello. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, Sentry is really a lifesaver. I'm not getting paid to say it, but at least at any moment in my company, there's probably two or three people looking at our Sentry and trying to decipher what's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, what's really anticlimactic, though, is going to tracing and seeing this onerous missing uh, instrumentation. Missing any instrumentation, yeah. advice? how to m make it not show up like so much because we are really uh, stumped why does it happen because we don't really do crazy stuff in our code that should result in such thing. Hmm, that's, so that's a good question. Um, there is a feature in Sentry where if you are sending profiles, which I know is a, is a different thing, but we're also able to capture a profile and show you within that missing instrumentation, even though we don't have transactions or traces, um, the, the code that's actually running during that time. That might help inform you um, to add more custom instrumentation there. But we can talk later about potentially why there might be a missing, custom, missing customization. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for the question. And as there are no more questions at the moment, uh, I'd like to, to uh, thank you again for the talk. Let's have another round of applause. Thank you, guys. You've been great. And see you at your booth.